Am I on? Oh, there, now I'm on. I love a microphone. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Point, a new um, conversation series here at Arts Emerson, building upon our long um, history of public dialogues with artists and community ac activists um, engaging in conversation. Um, we're calling the series The Point. It's a new approach for us. Uh, we're calling it The Point because you'll often hear us talk about the fact that what you see on stage at Arts Emerson is the provocation or the prompt, and the conversation itself is the point. So what, this, what happens on stage as a way for us to understand ourselves and our connection to each other and the world that we, we live in. So we're excited to launch um, tonight. Um, the, the point of the point is to create an intimate setting, almost like a salon in my living room or our living room, and to really in tackle sort of big issues in this intimate s setting. I would offer that we move in close together, but we have these amazing camera positions that we don't want to uh, disrupt um, at the moment, which also is to say that um, we are celebrating many modes of experiencing hence our delay, because we are live streaming on YouTube. There are people who are um, tuning in there, and so we're capturing that for that, that purpose, and I just want to give a shout out to the folks from Emerson Production. These are the students and team members from Emerson Production who are um, on hand to capture, this, um, to capture this evening. My name is uh, David House. I had to look at my notes for that. Um, my name is David House. I'm the executive dir director here at um, Arts Emerson, and it's a pleasure to really be with you this evening, and even more of a pleasure to share this space with some friends that whom I'll introduce in just um, a minute. Um, I, before we get started, it's always appropriate to um, acknowledge um, where we are, the land on which we stand, and so for that, I'm going to invite my esteemed colleague, our director of artistic programming, Ronnie Pinoy, to offer a land acknowledgement. And I'm gonna cheat and stand and, and break the living room vibe, so forgive me for that. Um, but good evening, everyone. I'm Ronnie Pinoy, a director of artistic planning, um, and I am Cherokee and an unenrolled member of the Pueblo of Laguna. Uh, so at Arts Emerson, we hold ourselves accountable to the work of undoing oppression and advancing equity to overcome our city's bitter history of segregation and racial inequality. As part of this work, we must start by acknowledging that we are residing on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Wampanoag and Massachusetts people whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Wampanoag and Massachusetts elders, past, present, and future, and they are the traditional custodians of the lands on which we make and present our art. We acknowledge the truth of violence perpetuated in the name of this country and make a commitment to uncovering that truth through dialogue, partnerships, and learning. And in that vein, I encourage you all to follow the incredible work of artist and educator Siobhan Brown, who is Mashpee Wampanoag and a dear guest that we are privileged to have on our panel tonight. Uh, so thank you all very much and uh, very uh, grateful to be a guest on these lands tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, so as I say, we are um, in this intimate space, also known as the beautiful um, Paramount Theater Orchard Stage, which seats 600, even though we are trying to create this space here. Um, we are very informal. This is almost like we're sitting in a living room, and so I invite you, as you need, to refresh your glass of wine and get a, uh, a drink. There won't be a break, so we'll um, just take care of yourselves. We'll try to take care of ourselves as well and, and invite you to engage. So we will start the conversation um, and then we will um, be looking to you to actually engage in conversation. So I want you to be thinking about um, questions that you might have or um, offerings that you might also want to um, bring in the, in the space this evening. So I, I'd love to get started um, just with a little bit of a of framing. Throughout the centuries, there are those in positions of power who've made an attempt to usurp rights and freedoms and beliefs that anni and annihilate cultures in order to control and conquer. For generations, those who've, whose rights have been assaulted have had counter movements through rebellions and protests and, uh, and different kinds of movements, many that have leveraged the artistic expression as a tool. So tonight, lifting from the theme of our season opener, which is drum folk, 
shameless plug, I hope you already have your ticket. It runs from October 6th through the 13th or something. Um, but anyway, lifting the 16th, thank you, lifting from the theme of um, drum folk, which uh, perhaps many of you know explores um, the story of the Stono um, Rebellion of um, 1739, where a number of African, uh, African American slaves um, rebelled and revolted against the oppressive people moving through South Carolina. They eventually were um, uh, stopped, many of them killed, and the subsequent um, Negro Act that followed of um, 1740, which amongst many things, banned the use of drums, horns, etc., all in an attempt to sort of quiet, to annihilate. But the good news, and there's always good news, the good news is that this, th the, the theme of the piece is that you can take away the drums, but you can't take away the beat. And so in spite of the fact that these drums were mandated and banned from um, African Americans, they embodied the sound inside themselves. So there was a resiliency that was true for them, and there's a resiliency that still lives today. And I would say that um, there are many examples of that kind of resiliency throughout our complex history here in the United States, and the fight for cultural reclamation continues um, today, whether it's in museums repatriating sort of the stolen objects, whether it's the um, land um, uh, ownership movement, or whether it's the Crown Act um, here in, in, the United S in, in Massachusetts, all in an effort to re reclaim those things that we have been stolen. And I'm thrilled that we have, uh, I have three of my friends, I'm calling us all friends because I, I'll talk about them in just a second, who are both experts in their experience and in, in their expertise around the reclamation of fashion, the reclamation of language, and also the reclamation of lands. And so we'll talk about that amongst many things. We don't have a script per se. We're going to sort of engage in conversation. We will follow the conversation where, th where it goes and, and again invite you on that, uh, on that journey with us. But I couldn't be more um, delighted to have with me and to be in the presence and sharing the space with three phenomenal humans. Um, and I will start, um, well I'm going to start from that end with uh, Jessica May. Uh, Jessica May is the Managing Director of, and of Arts and Exhibitions at the Trustees of the Reservations, as well as the Artistic Director of the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Amongst, um, in those two roles, uh, Jessica is responsible for overseeing all arts projects um, for the De Cordova, as well as a, a Trustees um, statewide network of over 120 conservation sites, including the trustees' commissioning program. Her research and curatorial interests can encompass a history of documentary practice, contemporary photography, and post-war figurative painting in America. Uh, Jessica and I uh, met through uh, an Arts Emerson patron, Val Talon, and I, Jessica invited me out to the De Cordova. It was actually my first visit there. I don't know, was that a year, two years ago? It was pandemic, yes. And uh, Jessica and I sat down, we took a bag of our sandwiches, and it's as if we had known each other for 30 years. Um, we engaged, we went right in into the conversation, no frills, <laughs> just right into the conversation, and we haven't stopped talking since. And so it's a pleasure to have, uh, share this space and to continue this conversation with you, um, Jessica, along with our, our other friends. I'll then move to my immediate left, your right, um, to Theo Tyson, who uses the pronouns she and they. Uh, Theo is a curator who invites conversations about the socio-cultural implications of race, gender, identity, and sexuality through the lens of fashion, art, and culture. Her practice focuses on creating sartorial spaces of reclamation and authority to share the powerful stories of black women and those on the LGBTQI plus spectrum. She is the Penny Vinnick Curator of Fashion, of arts at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston here. And if you had the pleasure of seeing the Muhol Muholi exhibit at the Gardner a few months ago, Theo was one of the co-curators of that amazing, um, amazing show. Uh, I met Theo f when she first arrived in Boston, um, when she came for the uh, as a fellow for the Athenaeum, where she introduced me to the stunning and amazing um, Hayden collection, which is a collection of daguerreotypes and other tin types of black um, uh, uh, people in. Beacon Hill and in Boston, an amazing collection that Theo actually really spent a lot of time with and was really trying to raise, a raise awareness of that amazing collection. So it's been great, and now she's at our beloved MFA, and uh, thrilled to have you here in this conversation as well. So, so thank you, Theo. And um, also, we welcome uh, Siobhan Brown. Siobhan is um, 
from Roxbury, Massachusetts, and a member of the Wampanoag tribe, um, uh, native Bostonian, an, active, an, an actor, playwright, activist, and educator. Um, she's worked with the Wampanoag mm -hmm. Language Reclamation Project as a student of the language since 2005, and has been apprentice in the, um, a, and a member of the founding team of the um, Winamu, um, um, school where they do Wampanoag language and cul cultural immersion school providing academic and indigenous education using the uh, Montessori uh, pedagogy for decolonization and language reclamation. Siobhan is the co-indigenous solidarity and sovereignty officer of the board of Montessori for social justice and might I add a proud alumna of Emerson College. Um, and um, if you don't know Siobhan and her practice and her work, you will want to get to know all that she's about. We are excited to enter the different kinds of relationships with Siobhan and her practice here at Arts Emerson. So please join me in welcoming and um, our my friends um, to this evening's conversation. <laughs> so as I uh, mentioned, we're exploring this, this theme of reclaiming that ha which has been stolen. Um, picking up on the theme of drum folk. And I thought as a way of setting the frame for this uh, conversation is to was be to read from the Negro Act of 1740, a brief excerpt, just to kind of ground us in the history in which we're trying to uncover, reclaim, and speak into. This is the 37th article of that act. It's a very long act. They had a lot to say about how we control people and take what belongs to someone else. But this is just an excerpt, and I'm, I'm doing a little bit of paraphrasing, so um, please indulge me. It reads, and for that, it is absolutely necessary to the safety of this province, all due care be taken to restrain the wanderings and meetings of Negroes and other slaves at all times and more especially on Saturday nights, Sundays, and other holidays. And they're using and carrying wooden swords and other mischievous and dangerous weapons, or using or keeping drums, horns, or other loud instruments, which may call together to give sign or notice to one another of their wicked, and per wicked designs and purposes, and that all masters, overseers, and others may be enjoined diligently and carefully to prevent the same. Be it enacted that whosoever master, owner, or overseer shall permit or suffer his or their Negro or other slave or slaves at any time hereafter to beat drums, blow horns, or use other loud instruments, or whosoever shall suffer and countenance any public meeting or feasting of strange Negroes or slaves in their plantations shall forfeit 10 pounds current money for every such offense. They were serious about silencing the use of any instrument that spoke to culture, that spoke to language, that spoke to freedom. And not only were they harsh on the slaves, they had an offense for the slave master. There was a, a financial penalty for doing so. But I just offer that as a way of entering in this conversation. And as we think about the gravity of those words, um, you all have, in your experiences, experienced this notion of reclamation. Sort of what, res what sits with you in hearing those words? And maybe I'll just throw it to Siobhan. We're going to try to keep it like not a park and bark, like hear from this person, hear from this, but really interject with each other and interrupt with each other and you know, disagree, agree, celebrate each other. Um, so maybe start with you, Siobhan. I know we talk a lot about, um, and many of us know about the importance of land right, in the indigenous community, but it's not the only thing <laughs> that was stolen. I wonder, and maybe you just pick up a mic, we're going to pass the mic there, um, any one of them. Um, just talk a little about sort of as you hear that language from the ne Negro Act, what resonates for you in your culture, in your lived, lived experiences? Um, um, Wanina Kana Tasuis Kisakuyel, Nutomas Masipia Kana Tai Masipia. Super important to um, introduce myself in language and say thank you. Thank you to everyone for being here and for this conversation. What comes to me um, is what rings so familiar in that text that you, that you read from the act 
very, very similar to um, one that was here in Boston um, for, for many centuries. Um, after the uh, King Philip's War, there was a lot of um, concern. Um, so it was illegal for um, two or more Wampanoag people to gather um, in the area now known as Boston Common. Um, and they would come through um, what it was known as Roxbury Neck. And, um, you know, similar language, um, you know, be careful of this barbarous crew, um, that there was, although there, you know, was, um, although there was uh, peace and there was um, an uh, end to um, physical violence, um, there was just this, you know, this act that stayed on the books until, uh, I want to say, uh, the late 1990s. Um, Mayor Menino was, um, uh, you know, uh, took that off of, took that law off of uh, the books. And, and so that kind of um, language, that kind of um, manipulation, control, fear-based um, use of law um, w was, was used a lot um, for, for all many different things. So not just gathering, but also speaking in language, um, songs, um, the drum, dancing, um, singing and dancing uh, in indigenous um, communities is a form of prayer. It's a form of communication. It's um, a reinforcement of spirituality. So anything to disarm the connection um, to within was the practice. And so it sounds very, very familiar, of course, um, to, you know, to not only the Wampanoag community, but to, to you know, the, um, the entire nation, which were at its height was over 60 tribes all up and along the, um, the eastern coast of Massachusetts. And, and the, the, uh, just 1990, I mean, that you did hear that's when the that was sort of taken off the books. This notion of this and the insistence of this kind of stealing and taking away. And so maybe you, Theo, I, I mean when you hear kind of this in in your practice and your experience and sort of what is this kind of this passage? What is it sparking for you? What's the thing that you think about as you hear this um, this insane <laughs> kind of? Um, thank you. It's, the first thing is, you, you know, kind of followed it up with a bit of a, a joke of, you know, they were serious. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I think about is they were, they were serious and they continue to be serious. There, there is a persistent demand to disarm and detach folks from the things that would make them most powerful. Um, again, whether that's language, song, or dance, um, it shows up in fashion as well. Um, one of the few things I think people think about in fashion history is there's, you know, I know there were sumptuary laws at one point where, you know, you couldn't have too much fabric and, and so on and so forth, but that's a very cursory look at the way clothing and dress has been managed to control and oppress going from you know the the insistence upon enslaved people wearing something that was eventually termed negro cloth um, and you, you mentioned the albums that I was talking um, about when I was working at the Athenaeum a group of absolutely stunning African American individuals from the 19th century and uh, one of the reasons that David made the, the comment about people is we're not actually able to identify if they were enslaved at that time or ever simply because of the way that they were able to self fashion. And so that was something that was, you know, consistently taken away. Um, you mentioned the Crown Act. Um, my hair is something that I struggle with, unfortunately, every day not because it's unruly, but because society is unruly and the way that they judge me for the expression of my natural self and culture. And so it really just does make me think about all of the ways and we're, we're specifically looking at 
at race um, in, in this particular moment, but if we move to look at gender and sexuality, the cross-dressing laws that were on the books, yeah, everyone famously, you know, Oscar Wilde famously went to jail. So there, there's, again, there's been rumors of this, this control um, that's always present in, yes, they are laws, but think about what the laws are for. You know, if you have a, a governing body that is willing to govern your actual body, what hope do, what hope do the people have? And that's what these laws were, were made to do, was to take away that hope. And the first step in that is taking away the ability to communicate hope and connect with those things that, that give you hope and sustain your faith. Thank you, Jessica. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, I um, just sort of want to acknowledge what I'm hearing from both of you and also to sort of add to that, that one of the things that's so breathtaking when you read a law that's separated by, you know, nearly 300 years is just how amazingly systematic it is and how um, the, the kind of like pure, cold, calculating logic around dehumanization has to follow like a certain, a certain structural set to, to deny the human, to deny the self, the being, but also to deny the points of connection between one human and another. Um, and that that's actually a kind of a time-honored system for dehumanizing people. And we see it again and again throughout history. And I've been thinking so much this past week about the community of 50 Venezuelans who were, sh who were put on an airplane and told they were going to Boston and instead landed in Martha's Vineyard. And I was thinking about the stories that I have heard about the kind of um, strange and shuffling but quite warm welcome that these individuals got and thinking like what a, what a strange experience these people must have had to land in Martha's Vineyard and what a profoundly calculating dehumanizing act. Like just the effort that went into thinking through taking away their agency and autonomy that's the piece that's consistently chilling to me. And yet it's more or less always a failing effort because <laughs> I mean, to go back to you, um, to your point, like the, the beat goes on and one could say that many different ways. That is always going to on some level be like an, a, a profoundly damaging and traumatizing, but somehow unsuccessful or incomplete effort. Even though, again, it consistently fails, it, that it's relentless. Mm -hmm. There's something about um, this, the, the reclaiming that you're talking about that's insistent, and there's, it, at the heart of it, it's the dignity, right? There's so much that's stolen that you're reclaiming. I know in my lived experience in this body, I'm constantly reclaiming my dignity in these exp experiences. But you know, what I, what I and just going back to you, Jessica, there's, there's so much that's reclaimed. We talk about land, and I know in you, in, in an institution, uh, um, uh, um, Theo, you're also in part of an institution that has been part of a practice, right? And so I'd love just to for Jessica to speak about what it means to be a part of a reclamation journey in a position such as yours, um, and just talk about what that looks like what are the challenges of it? How do you actually engage in that conversation as a curator, as an artistic mm -hmm. director, as a representative of an institution? That's so, um, it's such an interesting invitation to think about that because I come to this conversation with a lot of humility. I'm like literally the voice of the institution and I, you know, and I identify as a white woman. So And just to I say, <laughs> just, we are also <laughs> representing institution. I think exactly, we are exactly. all sitting on those so one of the uncomfortable facts about the history of land conservation in America is its relationship to redlining and its relationship to um, uh, the forms of segregation and in some cases, and, and I can't, I, I don't know the full history of the trustees, so I, I can't speak for that, but when we conserve land and when we use the language of protection, that is we're protecting it from people, right? We're protecting land from other human beings. And so conservation um, and the kind of caretaking for land, which I 
deeply value as part of the kind of fabric of urban life has a really um, has a history that we need to own up to um, in terms of what in terms of lands that have been taken from other people um, or claims to land that have been taken from other people. Um, and so one of the invitations that came with my role at the trustees was the invitation to work with artists and to empower artists. And m they're going to be mostly artists of color um, to shuttle as much um, care and financial resources as I can in order to give them the space to make art on our land. Um, so one work that we have on view this now that has been um, one of the most extraordinary professional and, and frankly personal experiences of my life is, is a project that um, the artist Rose B. Simpson, who's a Pueblo artist um, of the Tiwa people living in northern New Mexico, um, has um, has made um, and is on view now at Field Farm. And we actually have an image that um, we can show you. But what's been interesting about that is that in order to invite artists to participate on this land, we also have to invite them to be in conversation with the communities um, and the historical communities that have resided on that land. So. Can you just say a, um, a few words about what we're seeing? I'm more than happy to. Um, so Rose is a seventh generation ceramicist from Santa Clara. And she um, is someone who found a second language from ceramics to contemporary art as a graduate student at RISD and has continued to work in the two different languages, the language of her family and her home and the language of contemporary art. And she draws from both. And um, she came to us with a proposal for these seven, for these 12 beings, um, 12 being a deeply symbolically important um, number for her. They're almost 10 feet tall, um, and they have, you can't really see it here, but they have hollow eyes. And they're, they're feminine, but they're not strictly female. They have a, an ambiguity to them. But Rose talks about them as somewhat androgynous mothers, and they are, they are the watchers in this field. So they are both guests in this field. They are the guests of the Stockbridge Munsee people, whose land, um, whose homeland this this field is. But they are also watching us as kind of uh, a kind of um, a metaphor or a visual language um, of the earth having. A, a, a of us having some accountability to Earth for what we do here. Um, so their vision and their presence on this land is activating to the land itself and has activated a set of relationships that have put us in deep conversation with the uh, Stockbridge Munsee people whose homeland this is. It's a stunning, it's a stunning work of, and um, if you haven't, is it, it's still, yes, it's a permanent, it's, oh gosh, no, it'll be up through, we think, the middle of May. So it is, um, I it's, uh, it's a work that stops you in your tracks mm. um, and um, I is, is arresting in a way that I have found consistently extremely complex. Yeah, and when, when we look at this, I, I, I don't know if you can see the image, but a, an, a, an artistic expression of really reclaiming because as we know, um, many institutions take up space, take up land, and really trying to figure out what is the artistic way, because as we know, art has been at the heart of so many protests, so many rebellions, and this is a one expression of, um, of that. I know, uh, Theo, you talk about in your work, particularly um, in the museum world, that it's not enough to, and we were having this conversation, not enough to just to bring the artist in, not enough just to put the painting on the wall, but there's a really about a reclaiming power. Can you talk about what that feels like in an institution where you are seeing a, the force is often working against you, right? Mm -hmm. Holding on, protecting from whom mm -hmm. is a question. How do you how do you reconcile that in your in your practice? And that's to say that it's actually been reconciled. <laughs> how are you <laughs> pretending to reconcile it? Um, and and I, I, I say that jokingly, but it's you know kind of what Jessica was mentioning, like there's 
there are the things that we see, and then there are the things that we tend to forget, which are the systems that were put in place that give us what we what we see. Um, and I did talk about this a lot with the um, Zanelli Maholi exhibition at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, because there was a huge community component, and there's I especially in the in the wake of everything that that happened, and I don't want to get too far off, to off topic, but it, it speaks to performativity. There are so many institutions that perform this, this space giving, this sharing with um, indigenous folks, with people of color, with queer folks, but with what authority and with what change or shift in power dynamic. Um, one of the things that we don't think about when we walk into a museum and the it's there's no different at the MFA is you almost feel the voice of God and I say the voice of God because who has authored what you're being fed so when you don't have someone that has even you know even the people that are giving us this you know this very patriarchal you know canon centric didactic won't identify themselves as an oppressor so now you can't figure out like how do we resolve this? So when you offer someone to come into the community, it's not just please let me have your your beautiful hat and let me put that on the wall so I can say look I supported an indigenous person. It's like no, what authority does this hat have? <laughs> what authority does the person that made the hat have? What was the intention? And then also being very mindful of the impact because a lot of the times and Jessica I don't know if you've experienced this is most of the people that complain to the institutions are the people who complain about everything anyway like if you shift the painting over two inches that's going to cause a letter um, but these are the people that we're you know listening to when we talk about you know it's hard to change an institution and people will get upset but so now let's go back to what people are we talking about? Are we talking about the people that were affected by redlining and having their land stolen? Or are we talking about the people that don't want to give those lands back and don't want to discuss the provenance on, of the works that are on our property? And just one more quick thing, there's in, in regards to performativity and not giving you know proper authority a lot of museums have started doing um, dual language text on the walls. So you'll go in and you'll see English and you'll see Spanish. That does not take into account how many other different members of the community. And I mean, again, you're, you're from Roxbury, like how many different languages are spoken in Roxbury, in Boston, in the community abroad. So if we're looking at the work of um, a diasporic artist with roots in Haiti, why would we not stop to think like perhaps French or Portuguese could be a better connection to that work so that work has more authority in that space so the people coming in can connect to it and again, they're not listening to that voice of God tell them what they're supposed to be seeing. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, and... Um, <laughs> um, what was coming to thought as well with, with these institutions, right, um, is beginning, right, we're, we're talking about moving beyond land acknowledgement in a lot of ways, right, but we're also talking about um, mm, being in right relationship with, and I, and I think this is true for schools as well, um, being in right relationship with the original stewards of the land on which your institution occupies. Um, yes, it is through the medium, um, you know, that, that, that um, the institution um, exercises and everything, but um, there are um, ways and um, really uh, urgent um, need for for these institutions and schools and universities to be in right relationship with tribes, to be engaging with tribes, um, and to uh, be aware of what the needs are um, of of um, tribes today, because a lot of what we um, 
you know, what we learn, we're doing in this process, I guess, of unlearning uh, and, and learning um, true history and, but and, and sort of doing away with mythology. At the same time, what, how does that inform um, what we're doing in sort of to the authority that you're speaking on? How does that inform our practice? How, uh, how does that inform what we, um, what we bring to the public and how? Um, because when young people are, you know, um, are in, in schools, in institutions, um, the, you know, the, the act that you read from continues when there is no rep rep uh, representation. When, there I when there's active erasure, um, we can't move beyond acknowledgement. You know, when there's active erasure of a culture, active erasure of indigenous people, um, dismissal of black and indigenous sol solidarity, um, when we need to have the, um, the, the, the forces um, that, that let us know that what was already here, what was already here before, um, you know, before these institutions came, came into being is really the foundation. That's really the foundation. We really aren't interested in going back and, and really doing the real work. I think there is a performance that we all feel. And I'm, I, 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 I think about those many who are around us who say, you know, why do you keep fighting for this reclamation? You have a good life. Just keep going. Why, what, what, what keeps us in this fight? Because as we say, it's daily. It's, it's brutal. It's relentless. It's ever-present. What keeps you in this fight for reclaiming? And I just wanted to say, I forgot to, uh, thank you for gifting us with your language. It is a gift mm -hmm. to actually hear that in your voice, in your tone. Mm -hmm. um, because again, that's, it's so easy to not remember mm -hmm. that that exists. So I just wanted to say thank you. But mm -hmm. what keeps us in the fight? And I'm just going to invite you, Jessica, there's a mic right there. Just pull that so we can um, just chime in there. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, first got to give a shout out at Vita Chusit on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Check her out. <laughs> um, Tia Pocknet, shout out. Got you in the Tonquas. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, what keeps us in the fight? Because it's still going on. The, the, the um, effects of oppression on the human spirit are still, um, uh, you know, doing their best to manifest. Um, and as well as when we connect with language, when we connect with land, we are connecting um, to our true selves, right? And so, you know, like when, when the language project was um, coming, um, coming into fruition, our founder, um, Jesse Little Doe Baird, um, uh, Mashpee Wampanoag woman who just had a profound experience with connecting to um, a dream that she had that that um, repeated where she heard language um, and you know realized that you know walking around that language was all around her and so when they started to ask about um, about language and ask elders because it wasn't spoken um, for over a century, it was called what is a, uh, what is called a sleeping language, and so when you know she was really reaching for language and asking about it, um, you know wh why is our language lost? And what what the, what um, folks were told um, by the elders was that it's not the language that's lost; it's it's you. It's us. It's we. We who are lost, right? So this reconnecting is is of course first and for foremost, you know, that answering that call within each Wampanoag individual, because when we learn our language, you know, we we're learning how our ancestors saw the world. We're learning about, um, you know, so many different things. Uh, the 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 seen and the unseen. Um, we're learning about the connection to land. Con the connection to one another um, and, and in the way in which um, our language um, is, is, uh, is um, fixed, you know, we're, we're seeing so much and learning so much that we, you know, we it, it, it was bound to happen eventually, <laughs> like it, 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 it had to happen. It, these, are, these are things that just had to happen. And so 
you know, super gratitude um, to, to Jesse for, um, for all of the work and other uh, early language learners because it gives us, um, it gives us uh, you know, that answer to that call that comes up in, in every one of us to connect to our true selves. Because the erasure, like I said, it, it didn't work. Like the erasure always fails. It always fails, you know. We're, fi we're finding that connection to land. We're finding, um, you know, we're finding thousands of children who are wanting to go home, you know, in, in boarding school, who were, who, were, who were killed during um, a trauma and in, in, in murder in, in, in boarding schools. They are calling to go home. So that connection is not something that um, that any institution or system can um, can can erase. Yeah. When you go ahead, Jessica. Oh, I was just going to say, and um, I'm both moved and going to be thinking about what you just said for a long time. And it it strikes me that it kind of goes back a little bit to an earlier moment in our conversation because, you know, what what the Negro Act did was it like the the technique of erasing humanity is the technique of erasing the technologies of communication and expression which is language music um you know the, the written word and that that's it, it strikes me that one of the most aggressive forms of colonial behavior is taking away those points that that create community as a basis for human life and i think for me, one of the things that I feel most challenged by, but also most motivated by, is to go back to what you were saying. How do you get right with a tribe? You have to do it by thinking in terms of community, mm -hmm. rather than thinking in terms of individuals. And I just, I just feel like there's something in the kind of challenge of reclamation from the institutional side is to kind of honor both the person and the community. Objects, people, the language, linguistic histories, and that is easier said than done, but it, it just seems to me that um, what you were saying brings up so much of that importance of, of the community as, um, as an essential part of, of what it is to be alive. Um, you know, there's, um, there's something about the thing you're, you're talking about, we're talking about art and sort of that artistic expression, and I think about the erasure, we think about the sensory laws, we think about the clothing that, you know, back in slave days, they were re relegated to certain kind of fabrics, certain kind of patterns, actually to distinguish between those who have resources, those who have power, and those who do not. And I think about the reaction now, and I think about the, you know, invisibility countered by hypervisibility. Mm -hmm. And we think, I th my one of my favorite stories is, uh, uh, in the theater is coming, we were doing um, show Born for This, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and my black sisters had come from church with hats on, I mean, Beautiful hats, and the people behind them, we can't see, honey, that's not how we do it. This is how we do it, okay? This is how we wear hats. But that sort of, for so long, not being able to, any, many of them had not experienced it directly, but the ancestral instincts to reclaim through my own expression. You think about, you know, we talk about young people who wear their pants low. That's about being seen, right? Whether we think about it or not. I'd love for you to just talk about the other ways, again, the, because again, we talk about, you know, they've been attempts to silence, to shut down, to annihilate, and there's been a response, a counter response. I'd love to talk about um, uh, things that work well, whether it's in, in individual or cultural expressions, whether it's institutional expressions, mm -hmm. around how we've taken those things that have been taken away, and we show up in even more power, and in even in more voice in our own um, practices. Things that come to mind for you as far as whether it's um, from a fashion standpoint or from a, another aspect that speaks to how we use that creative, that artistic expression? It's a, it's a big question, David. Uh, <laughs> it's like, wait. <laughs> um, let me go back to, to what Shabon was talking about, like when you, when you think about taking away language and thinking about what you asked about earlier um, and being part, you know, being part of this institution, but diligently every day working essentially against that institution in a reclamation of my 
natural hair becomes necessary, a reclamation of not assimilating to a particular style of dress that would have me make other people feel more comfortable. Because when we talk about, you know, when you think about the, the drums and everything, it's like, what was the issue? It's like it made them uncomfortable. And I remember my mom used to hum all the time in the house, and it used to annoy me. And I'm like, why are you humming? Because she was like, there was a point where this was the only way that we could communicate. And sometimes there are no words for what needs to be said. So when you're talking about, like, you just feel those, those calls, you have to show up for them. And that's the thing that, you know, other question keeps, keeps you going is your, not just your dignity, but the dignity of your ancestors that made it possible for me to walk into an institution with a mohawk and locks and braids, yet I had to have a law for it to be accepted. And then we talk about, you know, going back to language, I stopped code switching. And not just the, there's a little Southern that happens, especially when I get tired. Um, but y'all, you know, there's little, there's vernacular. Those are subtle reclamations that I feel that we've always instituted. Um, there's an exhibition on view at the MFA right now, Art and Jazz. Um, and one of the things that it's looking at is those intersections of art and jazz and culture. And it's like that culture, unfortunately, when, I, when we say women's rights, there's a silent white in front of that woman. But when we start talking about things that were usurped and that were stolen, that silence becomes very loud because it's the, it's the erasure. Art and jazz and culture is art and jazz and black culture and Haitian culture and all of these other cultures from people that again were playing the drums but thinking about it from a fashion perspective. When you go back and look at the photographs of a lot of the, a lot of the jazz players, you see they essentially had on a uniform. Everyone had to have on a black suit and a white shirt. And that was something that was dictated to them by the, the club owners because they needed them to look civilized for their guests. So on, you know, at first glance, it looks like they just have on the, you know, very traditional, very patriarchal, very hetero, yep, black um, suit, white shirt. Look a little closer, you start to see details. You start to see these really high collars. You start to see points and different lapels and peaks and cuffs. So there's, that's how you keep going. It's like maybe, maybe I don't want to show up in like full carnival regalia to work. Maybe that's not the most appropriate thing. But I shan't have anyone tell me that I can't wear a head wrap or that I could not or that you could not wear your hat or that I could not dress androgynously or cross-dress as it were because we also have to think about where the construction of gender when it came to garments came from, which goes back to, you know, enslaved black men experienced, you know, the, the indignity of not being able to wear pants as a method of control, but then also as a method of pleasure for the slaveholders. So you think about all of the all the means and methods that have been used, those are the things that show up in our art because those are the ways that we fight. We think about the Zoot Suit riots. You know, we think about um, the Crown Act again today like you just mentioned. But uh, all of that answers the, the really, the first question that you asked is how do you keep going? You keep going by finding new ways to, to seek what is seeking you, right? Yeah, I would just add, <laughs> um, I attended a, a language um, language uh, gathering of other indigenous language programs in Hawaii, and we were charged with infiltrating all domains <laughs> with language. So, you know, as, as um, artists and artists of color, we are charged with infiltrating <laughs> all domains with language, with aspects of identity, with expression um, as an, uh, a radical act. Of, of reclamation, of existing, of being, of hypervisibility. Um, 
as well as um, what else came to mind <laughs> talking about the callers. Um, you know, my, my father moved here uh, to Boston when he was 12 from Texas and became fast friends had, with, uh, you know, a group. They had a group of guys, they had a group, they were the Dukes, <laughs> and a group, of, a group of women, and, um, and they would hold parties, and they would, you know, socialize together so that everyone would be safe. And he talked about a lot, uh, talks a lot about the, the collars, the high collars, and that, you know, they were so starched that when you saw somebody, they <laughs> When you saw somebody you knew, you know, you couldn't turn your neck. You had to turn your whole torso <laughs> and say, how you doing, man? You know, <laughs> that, that, the, that the regalia was, you know, the, even though your movement was restricted, you, was, you looked good. <laughs> and that was very, that was a big part of, of uh, expression and ways of being and dignity. And th it's what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, reclamation can be out loud and it can actually be quite quiet, right? Mm -hmm. And there's those individual expressions that we're doing every day to sort of distinguish, to sort of reclaim things in that, in that high collar or just a little feather in your cap or a different turn really reclaims. You talked about, um, we were talking earlier about the bead, the dresses that, the, um, that reclaim from the traditional regalia. Mm -hmm. You were wearing one the other day with mm -hmm. the, the ribbons, I guess it was. Yes, um, as ribbon a skirts. Contemporary mm -hmm. expression of reclaiming yeah. a regalia that had been, in many ways, sort of cut out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. W we'll you'll see. Um, uh, you know, today a lot of return to traditional regalia at celebrations and ceremonies um, here in the Northeast. Um, buckskin dresses and um, and you know mocks and um, leggings and. But for the contemporary um, expression, lots of beadwork, mm -hmm. of course, and um, and ribbon skirts and shirts um, are are an important part of expression that um, give give a nod to um, those in from the plains. Our brothers and sisters in the plains wearing wearing long skirt was. Um, important um, and then you know uh, ribbon skirts with um, with uh, red fabric as well to um, give support and amplification to the disproportionate uh, number of missing and murdered indigenous women um, uh, across Turtle Island and to raise awareness yeah. that families um, a lot of families don't get closure um, for for our our young uh, are missing um, women, and just seeing uh, also in in with you know returning to school right now, also seeing um, the support for young for young boys who wear their hair long, um, and you know there's a, there's a movement called back the braid, you know support one another. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing things on social media where beads are taken out of hair or our hair is cut because of regulations in order to you know to do a sport that that one may love and um, or you know uh, young young children being teased because you know they look different or wear their hair differently and um, you know the understanding the spiritual meaning behind hair the spiritual meaning behind a braid those three sections representing your mind your body your spirit and when they weave together you know uh, when when they're braided you know, by, by the loved one, by the loving and caring person at home, they're putting that protection over you. They're putting that protection, um, you know, uh, in that braid for your day and for, and for your classmates. You know, all important, um, you know, actions and aspects to expression. And I, Jessica, I, maybe you're going to chime in there, but I, just the thing about I, what I love is, again, th all those expressions are understood if you know the culture, right? But an opportunity to learn about something different if we're curious, right, um, in the, on this journey. And so many of us lack the curiosity that we need for that change to happen. And so I, the, the notion of the out loud and the quiet, um, because sometimes in institutions, our reclamation can't be so loud, mm -hmm. right? And so we have to figure out ways to quietly reclaim, and then people are like, oh, 
what do they just do over there, right? <laughs> so I know we're all experiencing, and, and I'm turning to you because I'm gonna be opening up in just a few minutes for any questions or comments or thoughts, because again, we're talking about very specific experience of reclamation, but in many ways, we're all trying to reclaim something um, that's been lost. And this notion of lifting up from drum folk, the, the drum as a symbol, there's a s drum in all of our lives in many ways, and it's it, this notion that um, it will be constant, we will constantly be fighting, and for me, the, what I love about the work that I do along with my colleagues is I can get angry about it, right? Or I can use art to express and to reclaim, um, reclaim that in many ways. So I want you to be thinking about ways, and we don't have a ton of time, but thinking about things that you might um, add here. But Jessica, did I cut you off? Well, I, I was actually gonna ask a question of you all following on, on both of you, um, speaking both from a personal perspective as well as, as, well as through, um, through your learned knowledge. Um, I feel like I see an incredible flourishing of young artists, BIPOC artists, working between forms that the word traditional is a very flat and unhelpful word, but forms that they have learned through the ancestors of their of their communities and forms that they want to claim for their own in in relationship to the contemporary world, either from what they see on TV or what have you, which is to say negotiation between the modern and the contemporary. I see it as an as something so important and interesting and vital within the full constellation of art that I experience as a curator and just as a human. And I was curious about um, what you all are seeing in that way and whether you're seeing that negotiation as something that's just, it feels so rich and interesting right now to me. Yeah, definitely with, um, I mean, our decision as a community to open a school was very strategic. Yeah. You know, um, language is preserved through children, it's through, through the babies. Um, because the children know, <laughs> right? They just know and they do. And they, um, you know, they have no inner, inner obstacle keeping them, oh, well, so much. Um, they have no inner obstacle keeping them from just following that, that, that instinct and that inner voice. Um, so, you know, th there's, there's definitely um, a, a um, clear purpose in opening a school and, and um, language reclamation programs, language nests, um, uh, homeschooling um, and immersion, um, that, that is important because what will happen is that they will then take the language to the next, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll then take the, the language to the next place, to the next level, um, and then seeing um, you know, young people represent, you know, at, at cultural events and um, what's happening in music, um, what's happening in fashion. Um, that expression, I think, is, is um, that alignment, you know, that sort of inner um, spiritual alignment of being in the now, but being their whole selves, mm -hmm. you know, um, and being connected to uh, who they are culturally and traditionally, but also uh, in, in the present moment, in the now. One of the things that when you, when, to be fully honest, when you ask that question, one of the things I thought is I've experienced that people have c always been working at that intersection of tradition and contemporary practice. We're in a moment now where people are recognizing it, and what I thought about are the economics, like we're recognize it but not resourcing it, mm -hmm. and there's also reclamation of the resources, you know, um, financial resources, yep. because um, we're seeing it, it's kind of trending right now in mm -hmm. the moment, which I find both wonderful and problematic. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it's not answering your question, but I do think that these practices have been there. We talk about art in these beautiful spaces. Art exists all around us and at that intersection. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean now that institutions mm -hmm. are recognizing and wanting to celebrate and wanting to invite in into, I often talk about, you know, putting a fresh coat of paint on a rotten structure. Mm -hmm. right? What does that mean as someone from whom something's been stolen to now embed themselves in relationship where the, 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 the real conversation that we mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. has, is not being had. Mm -hmm. 
being had. I, I think that's it, though, because it's, and this, this is actually a, a great place for fashion in this conversation. Because when we start thinking about, like you said, this has always been happening, but there's been a consistent lack of space and authority. Heritage houses, you know, even smaller independent designers have been stealing and appropriating culture since day one. Um, there's, you know, the, the ghetto until proven fashionable factor. Um, I love that. If, if I wear it with my, my black skin, it's not appropriate. But put it on, insert white pop culture icon, it's all of a sudden a new trend. Um, I remember the sickening feeling of cornrows being attributed to a person that starts with the letter K, because I'm not even going to say her name. Um, but when you see those things being so there's, and, and I think that's your, almost your, your point with your question mm -hmm. is it's just how have we been looking at it? Yeah. Because we've been, you know, there's, um, I'm trying to think of something that's very kind of specific. Claude Monet, you know, no one wants to argue with any of Claude Monet's work, but you have that Japonet painting. And then you follow that up with the John Galliano Christian Dior dress that was done in that same spirit. I'm like, Neither of them have any connection mm -hmm. to that culture. Mm -hmm. um, John Galliano has notoriously said, why bother to go to the country? Why even bother to engage you know, with the people when I can just take the bits that I want that I enjoy? Mm -hmm. So it's, as it is happening, it's like people have always been, been working in and wearing their you know, traditional attire um, their natural hair, et cetera. It's the acceptance. And there was absolutely a time I, um, I used to work in, in finance and there was most certainly a time where it was absolutely not acceptable for me to wear my natural hair and to not wear that classic Ann Taylor mm -hmm. navy blue suit with the whatever, whatever, the white whatever. piping and the buttons. <laughs> so again, there's as there is some change in some spaces, but the power dynamics mm -hmm. haven't changed, and who holds the resources has yet mm -hmm. to change. Um, and again, we, we do see that a lot in fashion. You have so exceptionally talented um, indigenous designers that you know are told by you know someone that they're trying to source material from that their clothing won't sell, mm -hmm. yet you look on the runway and you see a horrible rendition of it. Jamie Akamai. Yeah, um, <laughs> wanted to open up a little bit and make space for any questions. We have microphones here, and I think we're all close now. Um, so feel free to um, uh, step up to the microphone if you have a question. So I'm gonna, um, um, uh, thank you, Terry. I just have one, when you spoke about the, at the very beginning, the law that you read, was that for a specific state or was that a federal law? It's like most, it was started, in, it was in South Carolina, but it became, you know, it spread. Of it course was, it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it definitely was the law of the land, an unspoken law of the land. Everyone followed it because again, you as a slave owner were um, uh, 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 not reprimanded, but you were fined. Uh, for these for these things, so it actually certainly was more. It moved beyond uh, South Carolina. If I could just just another thought, you you asked about um, you know how how we how do we do that <laughs> that question, and I just had to laugh because I think that <laughs> definitely you reach a certain stage in life where you just do care, yeah. you know. <laughs> You just, you just, you know what I'm saying? And it, it, it is along those lines of infiltrating domains, but it's, I mean, you know, if you're gonna see me on the common doing Shakespeare on the common, you will hear Wampanoag, one or two <laughs> words of Wampanoag. Like it's it's just, you know, it, it comes to the surface after a while. You, you kind of get tired, you know, you, you just kind of get tired of not being your whole self. It, that's, yeah. Yeah. Shrinking oneself to make other feel others feel comfortable. I mean, I think and there's a lot of that stop. practice. And at, at, I hear you saying at some point you're like, you know what, I'm tired of doing that, right? And I'm going to um, 
to, to sort of reclaim that for myself. But yeah, I know it's been a really interesting conversation. I mean, it could go many different places mm -hmm. because there's, there's so much um, that has been taken from so many people. And we can name it, whether it's a, a cultural thing, or whether it's a racial thing, whether it's a gender thing, so much has been taken away. And there's such a need and such an interest. And for me, this is where the kind of the art form comes in. Because mm -hmm. you know when you don't have anything to do, I think about, um, as a musician, as a singer, I think about the Negro spiritual mm -hmm. as a form of reclamation. Like that was a way, like we can't do the thing, but we can sing these songs, you don't know what we're saying, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a quiet expression, although very verbal and out loud, of really reclaiming, like you can't take our communication away. Mm -hmm. right? You can pull us away, but we can communicate across plantations to understand how we connect with each other. Mm -hmm. That kind of, I, I know not what to do. Mm -hmm. I cannot reclaim what was mine. I mean, my l our life journey is ar around finding that. And I, again, for me, I feel very privileged to be in um, uh, connected with the art, which allows me, allows me to do that. Yeah. Questions, thoughts, comments, anything that's coming up for you, things that you are reclaiming in your own experience that you might want to bring into this, into this um, space? And she said that's why they weren't allowed to play drums, so they started tap dancing. And that's how that whole art form started. Yeah. And she was on a poster stamp. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is exactly what um, Step Africa, the company out of um, DC, it's one of the, it is the first professional step company. And they talk about um, step as a way of making the drum beats. Mm -hmm. So tap came out of that practice, step came out of that practice. Um, um, ham boned, you know. Humor. I don't. I didn't even realize until I was much older. We used to sing this. A ham, oh ham, oh wait a minute. Right. It's that's a part of the practice as well. So using the body to actually make the sound, to make the drum, to make the beat, is is sort of where tapping came from. And so what you'll see on stage are professional steppers, you know, who are using that practice to kind of reclaim that. Thank you for sharing that. Can I just say something really quickly to, um, I had the pleasure of listening to a gentleman named Dr. Kenneth Hardy, and he spoke quite a bit about the difference between comfort and safety, and that being one of the things that prevents us from moving forward, is that there's, there's a confusion between whether someone is uncomfortable or whether or not they are unsafe. The, you know, majority, and I put that in air quotes, quotes majority of society gets uncomfortable if they don't understand something. Like you're talking about, like there needs to be a curiosity. But we don't offer the same sense of humanity and respect and dignity that we expect when we travel abroad. Mm -hmm. But it's like, think about what it means to not be able to understand what's being said. And you know, as I travel and it's like, I hope no one recognizes that I'm an American. Because it's like that, that colonialism sometimes travels. It's like you're uncomfortable not understanding something for five minutes and you're ready to flip the table over. Yet there are you know, communities of people that have been forced to lessen their understanding of not just the language that they're being forced to speak, but of their, their, their mother tongue, their native language. So just thinking about like, why is it that there is this insistence on some people get to understand, but others don't, but we forget that there's always a way to communicate in whether that's music, fashion or something, but just thinking about, again, comfort and safety. And that's something that's just been rolling around in my mind. Um, and again, sometimes we perhaps would not wear our indigenous dress or speak our native tongue because we fear that if we make someone uncomfortable, we are now unsafe. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a crucial point that there, that I think it's such a crucial point that there can be a very fine line between comfort and safety if you're on the wrong side of it. Yeah. Um, so my wife was four when her family emigrated from the Philippines and so she grew up without American idioms, and she grew up without an, under an ingrained understanding of the American university system. So we still, to this day, 
she's like locked out of certain forms of, of the way that Americans speak English. And I'm always very aware of those moments as moments when she marks herself externally as different. Um, and um, and, and, they're all, and I, I can appreciate that those can be moment flashpoints where, where someone else's discomfort could become a, an issue of safety. Um, it, it happens in so many different and pervasive ways. Hence the, the out loud. Sometimes we can be very loud yeah. in our practice with our protest dress or our, c and sometimes we can be very quiet about that for that very reason. Um, well, I believe in blessing and releasing, and I feel <laughs> like we've had real, um, really in, uh, important conversation, just prompts from what we will see on the stage, and I hope it actually has opened up thinking for you and thinking about, again, in your own practice, the things that you're trying to reclaim or the ally that you will play in helping others reclaim what has been taken from them. That's equally um, as important. So we've talked about fashion, we've talked about language, we've talked about beads, we've talked about land and reclaiming that land. And again, I just want to um, thank and honor um, my friends uh, for sharing this space uh, with me tonight. Um, uh, we came into this conversation with a lot of generosity. I'm leaving with a lot of gratitude to each one of you and also to each one of you for um, making time this evening to engage in this conversation. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't also recognize and thank my colleagues here at the Office of the Arts and Arts Emerson with a speci special um, uh, shout out to uh, the creative producer for this um, gathering, who's Kevin Becerra, who's sitting right there. Thank you very much, Kevin. And again, a shout out to the um, Emerson production team who are around us doing am amazing work. We, with, um, we'll see the fruits of their labor um, in, in due time. And also to thank those who have joined us on uh, YouTube Live for um, engaging with us. Um, we invite you all to um, join us again and again and again. Um, uh, Drum Folk opens on October 5th and does run through the October 16th um, at the Majestic. There are tickets still available, but come quickly. Um, we hope to make uh, a big noise and reclaim and live inside that notion that, that they can take away the drum, but they can't take away the beat. So with that, I bid you good evening and thank you very much for um, joining us tonight. Thank you again to my, my dear friends. Thank each one of you. There's more wine, so. <laughs> <laughs>